anoint this place today. Guide our hearts and minds, and may your word be preached accurately and boldly, Lord, and may there be a response in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning is a... I told them this morning, this is the only way I know how to set this up. We have a Saturday morning prayer service here at 7 o'clock. Anybody's invited. We normally don't have a whole bunch, but uh, we just take turns praying. And this last Saturday morning, I was sitting and listening. I, my, my, I love to pray, don't get me wrong, but one of my favorite things is listening to other people pray. It's just, whew, sometimes those things will really light your fire. I was praying around the table, and, we, and, and, and Larry Inman began to pray. I'm going to throw him under the bus here. And he said something that just, gosh, I couldn't get it out of my mind. He, he said, Lord, we're going to baptize a lot of people tomorrow. Let them experience the excitement there must have been one week after the first Easter. And, and I've been thinking about that. Can you imagine that? I mean, the, the, he walked out of the grave a week ago. Last Saturday, they were devastated. The guy they'd been following for four years is gone. But this Saturday, they can't even kill him. Can you imagine the awesomeness that had to be in that group of people? Can you imagine when he appeared with them and when, when they knew his presence was in the room? Can you imagine the excitement they must have had? I mean, what, what can take us down now? I mean, they had to be living. They had to be fired up. Man, they had to feel something that there's no way they could put in words. And I felt that something. That's what's so awesome about it is that's 2,000 years ago and people still got goosebumps on the back of their neck. You know what I mean? That is awesome. There's something about that name. There's something about being connected with Jesus. There's just something about this thing that's more real than anything in the world. It's worth more than anything else. And the thing about it is, is as you know and I know people, they get it. You know what I mean? I mean, they got it. They get it. And they're excited. And they're fired up for God. And they got a joy the world can't take away. Yet again, there's a lot of people that claim his name. And they look like a bullfrog staring through a block eyes. You know what I mean? It, it just don't seem like it's set in yet. He's out of the grave. He's out of the grave. He's out of the grave. The past been made, you know. And so this morning, I kind of want to go back and read a passage of Scripture that would have normally been a pre-Easter passage of Scripture, but we're going to read it as a post-Easter passage of Scripture. So I want you to read with me, if you would, in Isaiah 53. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and this is that famous passage. This is usually labeled the suffering servant. And I'm going to read these five verses of Scripture. They're going to shoot it up on the wall with... I want you to wrap your mind around this I'm reading. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of God been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffer, suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. I love that passage of Scripture. It gives me willies just to read it and I already know it. But here's the thing about it. And this is what is so cool. Isaiah wrote what I just read you 700 years before the cross. All right, 700 years before the cross went down. Isaiah writes the passage of scripture I just read you. And so many people are so critical of Isaiah. They say that Isaiah's a hoax. He had to write it. He had to write it after the cross. There's no way he could have wrote that before the cross. And then in 1943, that little boy found what we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was dated 200 years before the cross. And it's a copy. 
Isaiah wrote 700 years before the cross. But the cool thing about Isaiah is it's 700 years before the cross, but it looks like he wrote it seven days after. Whoo! I mean, this guy's got some serious insight. And he says, who has believed our message? Who'd believe it? Man, Hollywood can't even make this stuff up. Who would believe this message that this Jesus come up before God like a root, like a green shoot out of dry ground? Jesus, what what he's saying is Jesus come from the place that you wouldn't be looking for him. Nobody was looking for the Messiah in a barn. Right? No, Nazareth, they said, can anything good out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But Jesus come out of Nazareth. And he goes on to say, he had nothing, nothing that would draw. You know, it boggles my mind when people say, I don't believe in Jesus. You're kidding. He's the most documented person in human history. Jesus Christ is the most influential person that's ever lived. To say, standing here looking at me, that you don't believe in Jesus is like saying you don't believe in me. You you don't have to believe I say what I am. But you'd be an idiot to have to believe I exist. I'm pretty much documented. I'm standing in front of you. You know what I mean? Jesus is as real as it gets. But he had no majesty. Listen to that. He, he had no bag. He didn't come from what everybody considered the royal line. Although we know now his ancestry has been traced very well. Matthew drove the nail on that one. He is definitely from the line of David. Yet he wasn't from the palace. It's kind of like I told him this morning. When you're in a royal family, you can't help but make the little newspaper by the checkout line. I mean, poor old Prince Harry or whatever his name is. He can stop and buy a bottle of pop and they'll put him in the paper. That's right, a poor old boy, I wouldn't have his lineage. He can't do nothing. If you pick your nose in public, they're taking a picture of you if you're in the royal lineage. You know what I mean? And so, Jesus didn't have that. The reason Jesus is all over the place is not because he was of royal lineage. And he had no beauty, it says. There wasn't nothing to draw you to him. He didn't have the Brad Pitt or the Tom Cruise thing going on. He wasn't some Hollywood figure guy. He had, the Bible says that he had something about him that people would turn their face from. You know that little spindly white dude that you see pictures of hanging on the cross? That's not what he looked like. Jesus is an Aramaic Jew. That guy looks like he ain't seen the sun in 40 years. That is not what Jesus looks like. I hate to bust your bubble. Jesus had nothing to draw. It's a matter of fact, it says he was despised and rejected. Isn't that what he was? You've read the story. Of course that's what he was. And it says that we considered him smitten by God, stricken by God. We considered him accursed. And you know what? We've been right. Can we put Isaiah 53, 10 up on the wall? Listen to this verse right here. This verse mind boggles people. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Now, I'm not going to read it all to you for time's sake, but if you read just a few verses up, it says that he would have no children. And then right down here it says, but the Lord would see his offspring. Not natural children, children of faith, children, spiritual children, reborn children. We are all children of God through Jesus Christ if we've called on his name, right? I mean, that right there is us, but it was God's will. The King James says it pleased God to bruise him. Man, that bothers people right there. I mean, I, I even met this one lady wanted to talk, she wanted to meet with me. And, and, and she didn't believe the whole Jesus was crucified thing. She didn't like it. And so she began to Google and write down stuff in a notebook, kind of making her own Bible, one that suited her. Because she didn't understand how a loving God would let his innocent son die. But isn't that the beauty of it? And what she didn't understand, what a lot of people don't understand, is not only was he the son of God, he was God. It pleased God to punish Himself. 
And I'm going to say that again. I want you to wrap your mind around. It pleased God to punish himself. What for? I mean, isn't that crazy? Why would God do that? He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our sin. You get that part, but listen to the last part. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds were healed. Folks, Jesus Christ come to give us peace. But not peace like the world talks about. The world thinks peace is absence of conflict. Jesus made it plain that he, until he makes all things right, there'll never be an absence of conflict. He wasn't talking about that. That's not the kind of peace he's talking about. And healing. People attribute this verse to physical healing. Jesus didn't have to die for your physical healing. He died for your spiritual healing. And the Bible is chock full of people that got it. They got it. I mean, they got it. And so before we go to Matthew, I mean to Luke 5, which is where we're heading right here in just a minute, Luke 5, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to be this dang honest. That's what I'm going to ask of you today. Is the peace that you're experiencing in your life right now and the healing you're experiencing in your life right now, is it worth Jesus dying for? Because the peace and healing he died to give you was worth him dying for. Is what you're experiencing right now in your life, the peace that you have in yourself, and the healing you've experienced in yourself, do you think that's what Jesus had in mind when he laid down on that cross and let him drive nails? Because what he died for is worth it. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to begin to read in verse 27. I'm going to read down to 32. It says, After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Man, I, I, I see, I love this verse right here. But the thing about it is, is you just got to grasp it. We're going to talk about some things in a little, just the next little bit. That's hard to grasp. Matthew Actually, he, Luke refers to him as his name when Jesus found him. Levi, Levi is a tax collector, all right? Now, follow me if you would. A tax collector is a Jewish man who has sold himself to the Roman government to collect taxes from the Jews. And they were almost all of them crooked. They had some serious moolah because the way you made serious money as a tax collector is if you were supposed to take 10, you took 20. You paid the Romans 10, you pocketed 10, it spent a good day in the business. You follow me? And so the tax collectors were hated by Jewish people. They hated them. As a matter of fact, the tax collectors weren't welcome in Jewish assemblies like the synagogue. You wouldn't see a tax collector hanging out in the synagogue. Even their families denied them. They hated these people. They were considered pagans because they had converted to Roman. You understand? And Romans were pagans. And so tax collectors were Jewish people who had took on a serious pagan lifestyle. But this lifestyle could give you some serious, serious economic advancements. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, these guys, they, they had it in, they was in the notch when it come to financial success. They was in the ditch when it come to spiritual success. And Jesus sees Matthew and the Levi in the tax collector's booth, in his tax collector's booth. And you can just kind of see it, there's money on the table, you know what I mean? I mean, he's been raking it in. He's sitting there trying to figure out he'd get a little more. And Jesus comes by and he says, follow me. And th this is my favorite verse in the bunch we read. Levi got up and left everything. What do you think that man? I mean, he left everything. He left the money. He left the job. He's not a tax collector anymore. He, he left the lifestyle. He's not a pagan anymore. Right? He left greed. 
He had to leave greed. He had to leave selfishness. He had to leave arrogance. He had to humble himself. He had to leave his pride in that tax collector's booth. Because this man who was rolling in the chips yesterday is now the follower of a homeless nomad named Jesus. Where'd Jesus stay? Wherever he could. Never had a house to call his own. All of a sudden, this guy who's a financial success story, he's a jerk, but he's a financial success story, is following a guy who's homeless. He left everything. Man, Matthew is excited, and he throws a banquet at his house. Whoo, it's a throw. And he's got all kinds of people there, and they're all labeled as sinners. Tax collectors and a bunch of other sinners. And they in there in the house. And the Pharisees, they come by, and whoo, man, they are fit to be tired. And they ask his disciples, why do you eat with a bunch of sinners? And I love this verse. Listen to this. Jesus said, don't you understand? The sick need a doctor. The healthy, they don't need a doctor. I didn't come for the righteous, but the sinner. J Jesus didn't die for those who don't need him, right? Those who don't need him are perfect. They're righteous. Jesus said, I didn't die for the righteous. I died for the sinner. Who do you think I'm going to hang out with? Who do you think I come for? Now, you heard what it said, Jesus died for the sinner. Well, what you didn't hear what it said is, who's the sinners? I all have fallen short of the glory of God. So, in other words, he was telling the Pharisees, I died for those who know they need me. You follow me? I died for those who know they need me. Folks, the Pharisee was as big a sinner as anybody in the house. He just didn't know it. You understand? This is what's so awesome. And I told him this morning, this is what makes me green around the gills. This is what makes me want to vomit. People who want to hold on to their old life, but they want all the benefits of Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? I've been in that category. They want to hold on to their old life, but still they want all the benefits of Jesus. They love to throw the excuse on you. Jesus hung out with sinners. Of course he did. He's the only perfect person alive. He's the only perfect person alive. Who else he going to hang out with? But the problem, what they don't understand is, the sinners Jesus hung out with are not the people they were when he found them. You understand? Levi became Matthew. The tax collector became a disciple. The pagan became a man of God. You understand? The, the, Levi is not who he used to be anymore. He's Matthew. He's a follower of Jesus. So all of a sudden, Jesus is hanging out with the guy who got sick of his old life and said, Jesus, give me a new one. So I just want you to start thinking about the people that found Jesus for a minute. I want you to think about Peter. The first miracle Peter ever seen is when Jesus told him he's fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Jesus said, son, you're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Put your net on the other side. Peter said, Lord, I fished all night, but because you say it, I'll do it. And he did. And what happened? He almost turned the boat over. And what did Peter do? He fell on his knees and said, get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. A sinner. Realized that day he wasn't Peter yet. He was just Simon. Simon the fisherman becomes Peter the apostle because he met Jesus. One of my favorite examples is Mary Magdalene. This right here foes the church of Kerbal. Little Mary Magdalene. You know what little Mary Magdalene was when Jesus found her? A woman with seven demons. You, you don't have to tell me because I've been in these discussions with people. It's probably most likely that Mary uh, Magdalene was a woman of ill repute. When you tell church people that, they say, oh, How dare you say that about sweet little Mary Magdalene? Folks, what is the matter with people? What don't they understand? Demon-possessed people are usually not morally correct. You follow me? Demon-possessed people generally are not your average model citizen. Demon-possessed people are demon-possessed. There's seven demons controlling this woman. She's sick and filled with sin. When she finds Jesus, when Mary Magdalene comes to Jesus, the moment before he flees them demons out of her, she is the woman I pray my daughters do not become. When she starts hanging out with Jesus, she becomes the woman I pray my daughters become. That's who my Jesus is. He takes messed up people. And turns them into free people with a heart filled with peace. That's my Jesus. That is who he is. That's who he was. That's who he still is. You know what I mean? Whoo, I love Jesus. 
and, 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 and he just don't just stop there. He just keeps doing it. And what about Zacchaeus, the little short dude? Everybody remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus ain't just a tax collector. He's a chief of the tax collectors. And he got all kinds of money. They said Zacchaeus is extremely, what the dude's filthy. Right? But he, he wants to see. I, that was his whole point. He wants to see the Messiah. He wants to see this life-changing guy. He didn't have any no intentions of Jesus talking to him. Why? Because he realizes he's a sinner. Pharisees up in the front like they got corn for sale ready to shake his hands. Zacchaeus is ashamed of himself. And it says he climbed up in a sycamore tree. And I've always been confused at how a little bitty short dude got up in a sycamore tree because that first limb will be 20 foot up. But it's a sycamore fig tree and they limb out down close to the ground. Man, that changed the story for me. The little short dude wasn't going up it like, like yeah, he just stepped up in the tree. You know what I mean? And, and he's just trying to see Jesus into his amazement. You know what Jesus does? He comes right straight to the bottom of the tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm going to stay at your house today. Woo, we love that story. What we don't understand is the first thing Zacchaeus said when he got to the ground. Lord, I'll give half everything I own to the poor. And anybody I've cheated, I'll pay them back four times. And some people say, right there, that's what Jesus wants, your money. Jesus never asked him for a dime. Zacchaeus was one greedy little sucker. And when he came in the face of Jesus, he owned his greed and said, Lord, I won't be that way no more. Zacchaeus was also a crook. And when he came to the face of Jesus, he said, Lord, I'm done with crooked. Everybody I've beat, I'll make it right, but I'm done with that life. You understand, Zacchaeus in the tree was different than the Zacchaeus on the ground. Because on the way down, he somehow or another submitted his life to Christ. Two or three steps down out of a tree and he's a changed man. Ain't that something? The hour I first believed. Whew, man, I love that. Well, what about Simon the leper? I love Simon the leper. Simon the leper throwed a dinner for Jesus. You realize what a leper is, right? A leper is a shameful, dirty outcast. He has to stay outside the city. He ain't even allowed around people. You understand, Simon the leper can't throw Jesus a dinner unless Simon the leper ain't no leper no more. You follow that? Simon ain't a leper. Simon used to be a leper. And what's cool about this story is it says, and Jesus was reclining at the table, and there beside Jesus was Lazarus, and whom Jesus raised from the dead. Now, it's obvious that Jesus has been active in Lazarus' life. Because if Lazarus had been dead, he wouldn't have been reclining with Jesus at the table. He might have been laying on the table, but he wouldn't have been reclining with Jesus at the table. You understand? Lazarus was come out, man. He had a new life. And I hope people can say that about me. That since I've been out of my tomb, I've hung out with Jesus. Where Jesus was, there Derek was. God, I hope they can say that about me. You understand? It's just so many people. And what about Martha? I love Martha. Martha was good old get her done Martha. Good woman. She was a good woman. But when Jesus was in the room, she said, Lord, I've got to get the dishes done. We've got to get home. The kids need a bath. We've got to get ready for tomorrow. Look at all this stuff we've got to do. And I, Come on now. What are you doing just sitting around listening to Jesus? And Jesus said, Martha, won't you calm down and sit down and listen to me? And see, right here today, it's, man, this guy right here, we got a bunch of baptisms. He's up there preaching a long time. Our kids is coming over for dinner. We got, won't you calm down and sit down and listen to me? You understand, Martha was getting ready to overlook eternity to accomplish something that wouldn't amount to 15 cents five days from now. That's what Martha was getting ready to do, was give up eternity for nothing. Jesus said, Martha, chill out. Sit down. God's in the room. Isn't that something? How many services you ever sit through where you were way too busy to worship? Way too contained with the things outside to really listen to Jesus? And what Jesus was trying to turn you into was a person so consumed with herself they couldn't see him to a person so consumed with Jesus they couldn't see themselves. That's what he done for Martha. Whew, I love Jesus. Don't you? I mean, that's who he is. And the reason I can tell you this is I was one of them. 
My story is different than any one of them I just mentioned. But I was so miserable because I had dreams. Man, I had dreams. I had more dreams than Rip Van Winkle or Martin Luther King or anybody else that was a dreamer. And I had all these things I was going to do for myself. And the more I chased them, the more I failed. And even the ones I accomplished made me miserable. Until I got to the place where I hated myself. Because, you know what Troy, I mean not Troy, Tom Brady said when they gave him his third Super Bowl ring. Anybody know what he said? There has to be more than this. I never got no Super Bowl ring. But everything I ever put my hands to, I said to myself, God, there's got to be more to it than this. I'm broke. I'm miserable. I mean, there's got to be more to it than this. And I remember at my weakest place, at a place where I decided I didn't want nothing to do with God because everything I'd ever experienced to God was something made up by man. I'm telling you real. I'd never really give myself to God. Oh, I know all the words to amazing grace, and I could quote you John 3, 16. I know all the words in Sunday school class pretty much. But I had never had a relationship with this Jesus. You understand? I was like one of them Pharisees outside. I know about Jesus, but I wasn't in there at the table with him like Matthew was. I just know about him. And when I truly submitted my life to Christ, I told them this morning the feeling I had, I have no idea how to put it in the English language. I come here this morning to tell you what peace feels like, but I don't know how to explain it. And I come here this morning to tell you what healing feels like, but I don't know how to explain it. But I know that day I got it. It didn't make me good, and I was healed, and I'm still getting healed. And I had peace, and I'm still getting peace. But I know the moment it happened, that I was a different guy than I was a moment ago. I knowed it. I can't explain it, but I knowed it. Because I got to that place just like Zacchaeus did, just like Matthew did, just like Mary did, just like Peter did, just like Martha did. When I said, all right, Lord, I've had enough. I'm in. I'm in. I told him this morning, poor little old Zacchaeus, his whole mentality was worldly. You know what? I mean, Zacchaeus probably, if you looked at Zacchaeus, you'd say, this guy is a success story, man. He is the chief of the tax collectors. He's got money sitting on top of his money. He had that worldly mentality. You know what the worldly mentality is, don't you? Get all you can and can all you get and then sit on your can. That's what the world Sam Tampton to do. You know what I mean? And Zacchaeus had done it. He was set for life. He could sit on his can. And he was miserable. Not everybody's down and out. Some people's up and out. But they're out. Just the same. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, you come to me and I'll give you something to drink that'll never thirst you again. Because I'm living water. He said, if you're exhausted, if you're burdened, if you're wore out, if you're put out with your life, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me. And the amazing thing about that is, is every one of those people who got changed come to Jesus tired of their old life and they got a new one. Listen to me. Every one of those people I just mentioned come to Jesus tired of their old life and they got a new one. Every single one of them. They all got a different story. They all got a different background. They come from different ethnic groups. But they all got a new story. Now I'm going to remind you one more story before we close up. The old boy at the garrison. Or the genocerate or whatever you want to call it. They all got different words for it. I don't know how to say none of them. The old boy over to the coppice that had a bunch of demons. Legion was their name because they were many. You remember the old boy? And he seen Jesus coming and the demons started hollering. What do you want with us, Jesus? And that? The poor old boy, they couldn't chain him up. He kept breaking the chains. He was sat there in the graveyard naked as a jaybird. Cut himself with rocks every day. It's right there in Scripture. And Jesus cast them demons out. That old boy, they went in that herd of pigs. And they all run down the hill and went out in the lake and drowned themselves. You remember the story now, right? And when the people of the town come out, they see no demon-possessed boy sitting over there with Jesus in his right mind and had his clothes on. And it says they were scared. A why? Here's a guy that's life has been totally converted right in front of their eyes. 
Here's a guy that yesterday was one messed up dude. And today he's hanging out with Jesus. And they're scared. What are they scared of? Well, one thing they might have been scared of is the cost. Jesus done drowned a whole herd of pigs. What's he going to do if he stays around here? You know what I mean? And a lot of people are scared to come to Jesus because of the cost. And if your way of making money is unrighteous, he's probably going to cost you something if you come to him. Because you're going to have to be old with that. You know what I mean? If you're greedy and stingy, he's probably going to work on that. So Jesus might cost you something. A lot of other people are worried about social status. Jesus can really mess up a guy's social status if you're with the social crowd that thinks you're it and Jesus ain't. I know because I say, you're it and Jesus ain't. You're cool. Jesus is not cool. When you start following Jesus, guess what? You ain't cool neither. And so it's got some serious social hindrances. He might mess up some relationships. If you got some relationships that's outside of Christ, he may cost you them. Or he may fix them. But you're going to have to pay the price whichever way. You know what I mean? You're going to have to say, God, I'm going to. Matthew left everything. He didn't say, Lord, you care if I bring my booth with me? He left the booth. And he also left the greed and the pride, and he just followed up and followed Jesus. We're here today, and I want to tell you, Jesus may take some things with you, from you, that you don't really want to give up. But you love him more, right? That's what it takes to be a follower of Jesus. It's not the fact that, I, that those things are easy to give up because God asked me to give up some things that I really liked. But I loved him. And so this is, this is what I want to tell you this morning. And, and, and some people are going to think I'm weird for saying this, and that's all right. But there's going to be people in this room today that like what I've said so far about a new life, but they're not willing to give up their own. And for you today, Jesus can do nothing for you. I know because I sit right where you are, not willing to give up my own, and I left as miserable as I got there every single time. Jesus can do nothing for those who are unwilling to give up themselves. He said, if he whoever wants to save his life will what? Lose it. I mean, he laid it right out right there. I mean, isn't it amazing? It shouldn't be a surprise when somebody told you. It's kind of like when you're at the doctor's office, and they say, this is going to hurt a little bit. And they do it, and you say, God, that hurt. No kidding, I just told you that. You know what I mean? And so Jesus is already telling you, following me is going to make you a little weirded out and uncomfortable. And I'm going to ask you to give up some things that you might like. But it'll be worth it. And I want to tell you something. What I'm about to tell you is that God's truth. This ain't exaggerated at all. I can show you I got the paper at my house. But I want to thank this person for their honesty. At the, at the crusade, a person come forward with their decision counselor. And that counselor come to me afterwards and said, we really need to pray for this young lady right here. But she was the, one of the most honest people there. She wrote in her decision box, I want it, but I'm not done with what I'm doing yet. Praise God for her honesty. I pray her spiritual eyes are open, but there's a lot of people that ain't got the guts to say it. Lord, I do want salvation, but I'm not done living the devil's life yet. If that bothers you to say it, then let's all be honest for one day. Because I could have wrote that in my box on many a many a day. Jesus, I'd like to follow you, but there's a few things I want to do for myself yet. And folks, I, I took the risk. I took the risk. If I would got killed in the time that I was running for Jesus, I would have burned in hell. I know that. I laid awake at night knowing that if I died before in the morning, I'd go to hell. I know, ain't that dumb? That's dumb. I don't care who you are, that's dumb. And I done it. I done it. I did it. I lived it. I know I was going to go right straight to hell if I died, but I wasn't ready to say, Lord, here it is. And I didn't until I got sick of my life and said, Lord, I want a new one. And the moment I got sick of mine, he gave me a new one. I wasn't perfect by no means. Matter of fact, I may have struggled more the next day than I did the day before, but I felt it. Like that, that it's mine. It's mine. Isn't that awesome? He said, if you're worried, if you're wearied, if, if you're troubled, if you're, if you're hard and come to me, my yoke is easy and my burdens light. Man, following Jesus is hard, right? But I'm already in. I'm not hoping I'm going to go to heaven. I know I am. Not because I'm good, because he is. I know I am. His yoke is easy. 
All that live in the life is impossible in one sense of the word. But it's yoke's easy because it's grace. I'm going to tell you all this because this was awesome. I, I, I got a lot of acquaintances, a lot of business acquaintances, a lot of friends. And I, that, that, that what, what you might not consider the Apostle Paul. You know what I mean? Uh, they, they ain't exactly as sanctified as they might ought to be, but some of them are working on it. And I was talking to this fellow in whom I've come to, to love, and, and me and him was talking about another friend that we share in common. And at one time, I wouldn't trust this guy I'm about to refer to. I'm not going to tell you his name, but if he was swearing on a stack of Bibles, I wouldn't trust a thing he said. And right now today, if he tells me something, I don't question it, not one day. I trust the man. I trust him in a big time way. And at one time I would have considered him the truth wasn't in him. And we was talking about it. And he said, don't you forget what you preach every Sunday. I said, I ain't forgetting it. I said, I ain't forgetting it. I know what he used to be and I know what I used to be. And I believe right now that neither one of us are the same guy. Thank God for grace. And that guy on the other end of the phone, and if you met this guy, you wouldn't think this guy was the most spiritual guy in the world. He's a baby in Christ, but he's getting it. He said, what are you talking about, man? If I had to be, if I had to stand good before God for the guy I used to be, what would I do? Because he ain't the guy he used to be neither. And I knew he had it. But to hear him say it, I wanted to put my hand over the phone and say, praise you the Lord because I love this guy you know what I mean but I heard him say something lost people don't say he's got it and man I want to tell you something he's big and ugly but if I was close enough I might have gave him a hug I tell you because the greatest day in your life is when you say God I'm done I'm done I want what you got and I don't much care what it costs here it is. Now, I'll tell you how we're going to do this today. Please don't nobody frown on what I'm about to say or do. Think about what I'm about to say or do. We're going to have a hymn of invitation, and I'm not going to ask anybody in here to close their eyes. God says to step out before men, and I'll stand up for you in front of my Father. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with closing your eyes, but I'm not going to do that today because I don't feel led to do that. I feel led to ask you, to step out and take a hold of the master's hand who's placed it in front of you. He was pierced for your transgression. He was crushed for your sin. The punishment that will give you peace was on him. And by his wounds you can be healed. And all you got to say is, God, I'm done. Here it is. You don't have to fill out no application. You don't have to pass no IQ test. You don't have to quote any scripture. You don't have to answer any questions. All you got to do is say, Lord, here it is. Here it is. I mean, think about that for a minute. Everybody that come to Jesus was messed up, right? I don't know nobody in Scripture that come to Jesus that had it together before they got to Jesus. And so if you're out there saying, man, you don't know how messed up I am, you're right, I don't care. If you want to tell me, I'll sit and listen. There's things about me I ain't going to tell you. I'd rather stand in front of a firing squad. I don't have to. He died to forgive it. You don't have to tell me neither. If you want to and it brings you peace. The Bible says confess your sin before men, and whatever you tell me will be between me and you. But I want to tell you something. If Jesus has forgot it, you need to forget it too. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Stop being so consumed with the world. Stop hanging on to things that ain't going to matter. You realize right now. I don't know who the youngest person in this room right now. A bunch of the kids went to the basement. We probably got a baby or two in the room, but everybody in here is going to be dead in 100 years. And for the biggest end of us, for the biggest end of us, 40, 50 years, everything we own is going to be in somebody else's name or less. Right? I mean, man, we're guarding it. We're sitting up at night guarding it. What about salvation? It's the only thing that matters. And folks, I want to tell you something. We need to be praising his holy name if we got it. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. If you're here today and you remember the time you met Jesus, and, and, and you ain't the same person you used to be. You need to be getting your worship on because you'd be burning in hell if you hadn't found him and he hadn't found you. Ain't that right? I am so, I tell you one thing that I, that you know what my biggest fear in this world is, is the person I used to be. And I hope that God never lets me forget that person. 
Some people say, oh, I know you, you're a good guy. Yeah, and you're naive. I know me too, and I fear that I'll be that person again. Okay? I don't want to be that person. I'm not going to be that person again because I met a life-changing God. It didn't make me perfect. That made me forgiven. Now, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. This is the way it's going to go down. Saying no to this invitation is not going to be saying no to me. And man, there's a bunch of people in here, and you're going to feel all goofy when you come up, you know. But the thing about it is, is if I said, I'll tell you what, I won the Powerball last week, and I ain't claimed it yet. And if you come up here, I'll give you the ticket, and we'll let it go. Would you say, oh, my God, somebody may laugh at me. Y'all knock each other down, you know what I mean? My God, man, a hundred million? Yeah, yeah. There'd be fights getting to the front, you know what I mean? I mean, people would be diving on the altar if I laid them a ticket on it. Yeah, we laugh, but that's true. Man, you go to a ball game, these people there painted in blue going, whoo! And they come to church and they're going, scared to death. Somebody's going to see something, make them look... Man, Jesus has offered you eternal life. He's offered you healing and forgiveness and peace. And the people that ran up to him in a big crowd and fell on their feet and said, Lord, have mercy on me, left different than they got there. And the people that was prideful enough to say nothing left with nothing. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. I'm begging you to think about this, man. Begging. Pride is the pathway to hell. And Jesus is the pathway to heaven. And some days you've got to choose which one you want to hold on to the most. Won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn?